we'll get started now. Uh, 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 seminar series. And, uh, I'm going to introduce Brian Martin today. Uh, Brian is Montana Grasslands Conservation Director for the Nature Conservancy. He's been doing that for 29 years. And uh, in the last 23, I've been in Montana. Brian leads the Conservancy's protection science and stewardship effort in the Northern Great Plains of Eastern Montana and manages a team of five staff. Program efforts are focused on working collaboratively with landowner agent, uh, landowners, agencies, and NGOs to conserve natural habitat for the benefit of nature and people. In short, these efforts have resulted in prominent protection in permanent protection for over 100,000 acres of private land and engagement with landowners uh, through the Matador Grass Bank and candidate, uh, candidate conversation, a conservation agreement. It's a mouthful. A lot of, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of acronyms. Um, with assurance program impacts management of an additional 300,000 acres of ranch land in North Central Montana every year. So, major conservation efforts there. He recently moved to Red Lodge, where he lives with his wife. He received a BS in Range Science from North Dakota State University, an MS in Range Science from New Mexico State University. Joining me, welcoming Brian. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for coming today and uh, delaying or, or uh, skipping a little bit of your lunch hour. So I, I appreciate your time. As Bruce said, I'm gonna talk about the Nature Conservancy's work in the Northern Great Plains of Montana. So uh, first of all, why the Northern Great Plains? Um, if we look at temperate grasslands around the world, there's four intact, um, pretty functional temperate grasslands. The remainder have undergone a lot of change. If you think about grasslands, those are, are you know, the bread baskets of the world. Um, so uh, a lot of our grain is produced there, a lot of um, human settlement is there. And so when we think about um, uh, the globe out here, the, um, you know, the Northern Great Plains uh, stands out. There's the uh, Patagonia in South America, and then uh, the Kazakh Steppe and the Darien Steppe uh, in uh, Asia. So we're fortunate um, to be close to um, one of these really intact areas, and I'm fortunate to work there. So when we think about grasslands, it's a bit of a paradox. You go, you stand out there, and you tower over everything around you, but then you look up and you realize you're a speck in this big, vast area. The other thing that's really not intuitive is that when you look at this picture of this grassland, you're only seeing 25% of that grassland, 75% occurs below ground. So every year, um, all these roots are producing all this material in the ground that's sequestering all this carbon that's also going in the ground, which is a important thing to think about. Um, the other thing that is really interesting and different about grasslands, especially in the Great Plains, that they thrive with disturbance and change. So if you take a grassland and put a big fence around it and say nothing is gonna happen in there, your grassland will become unhealthy and eventually will sort of decay and fall apart um, and, and change and not, not in a good way. So. These places have to have uh, disturbance. So I, I just was thinking about some questions today that I'll hopefully go through and hopefully I'll answer these, hold me to it if I don't. But really what I want to talk about is what, what's the Nature Conservancy really working on? Conservation is such a broad term. Um, so I'm gonna try to get to a few specifics. What do the species of the Northern Great Plains tell us about conservation? So um, a lot of times we have this kind of top-down view of things versus listening to the animals that are out there and really trying to understand the world more or less from their eyes. Um, what's causing uh, loss and decline of grasslands and, and grassland species? What are the right strategies to stop those losses? And um, what does success look like? So when we uh, think about the Northern Great Plains in, in Eastern Montana, it basically stretches from the Rocky Mountain front uh, to the west and obviously within the, the geopolitical borders, uh, the Dakotas on the east, we're 
obviously down here in Bozeman today. And so what I'm mostly talking about is this area in the circle. So if you um, have not been to Eastern Montana, um, uh, you would have uh, the towns of Malta and Glasgow in there. Um, uh, farther south, you'd be talking about um, Winnet and Grass Range and places like that. So this is a, a, a big area, um, probably about 10 million acres, just roughly within that circle. Um, most of it within that circle is gonna be intact grass. Um, and most of that grass is gonna be used for ranching purposes. Um, additionally, there's also a very sparse human population. So probably within that circle, uh, roughly maybe 10,000 people. So if we think about the Great Plains and we just start at the very beginning and the foundation of it, um, the Great Plains are shaped by climate. So really variable weather, um, long intense droughts, um, you know, high rainfall events, um, big changes between years, sometimes huge changes within years. Um, so a really variable climate, cold in the winter, um, hot in the summer. Um, the second really key driver to these systems is herbivory. So everything from large ungulates uh, down to grasshoppers and leaf hoppers that are feeding on these grasses. So one thing about grass is that they're, they're just an incredible driver of, of food for animals. So all of that grass plant is basically available that's above ground for, for grazing. The other thing that's a big driver historically in, in the Great Plains would have been fire. So, and, and fire really affects these grasslands. Um, fire uh, removes old residual grass, um, encourages rapid growth. Uh, large ungulates, as well as other grazers, are attracted to that. So, uh, fire was a big driver historically. It would have been caused both by lightning um, in, in midsummer thunderstorm events, but also by native peoples over the last 10, 12,000 years as they um, uh, applied fire on the landscape for their benefit. And so when we think about, and we talk about grasslands in, in Eastern Montana, um, a lot of people would say, well, I drove through a lot of sagebrush, where was the grasslands at? Well, in fact, these are grasslands, but they do have in places a lot of sagebrush cover. And um, it's important when we think about these uh, areas to compare and contrast those with the Great Basin. So if you followed anything about conservation and sort of the problems in the Great Basin, in the Northern Great Plains, these are still grasslands with sagebrush. They evolved with grazing, they evolved with fire, they evolved with disturbance versus those Great Basin grasslands really didn't evolve that way. Um, the grass plants are also very different. So if you go out and graze these plants, they're very resilient to grazing. Um, including very intensive grazing versus in the Great Basin, they really didn't have that history. So um, when you hear about stories about the Great Basin, the Great Plains, just know that that's really an apples and asparagus kind of you know, comparison. So they're, they're not at all alike. Um, another really great thing about uh, the Northern Great Plains, um, I, I failed to mention that of that 180 million acre Northern Great Plains area, about two thirds of it, or about 120 million acres, is in essentially natural vegetation out there. And because we have all that natural vegetation out there, we also have the most complete wildlife assemblages in the Great Plains. Uh, most of the species that are there that um, would have been viewed historically, um, and we still have large numbers. It's not unusual to see hundreds to thousands of pronghorn um, in an average day, um, especially in the fall um, and winter when they're more um, bunched up. Um, and so big numbers of, um, of animals as well as, um, as well as healthy populations of a lot of those animals. One of the really uh, interesting and defining um, characteristics in the Northern Great Plains is migration. So, if any of you have woken up in January and thought, how do I get out of here? Um, it happens that much earlier for a lot of these wildlife species. So this is an extreme climate. This is the northern edge of the Great Plains, right? So um, these animals are, are in, a, in difficult locations and they need to be able to move. So in the case of pronghorn, they'll make a movement some years of over 200 miles one way. Um, from the southern uh, Canadian provinces and the High Line of Montana down into central Montana, almost all the way down to the Yellowstone River. 
that's the second longest land mammal migration in North America, second only to caribou uh, up in Alaska. So when we start to think about conservation, and I mentioned this before, when we start to think about the scale of conservation, we need to account for the fact that pronghorn are gonna move across hundreds of acres. And how are we gonna think about our conservation within that hundreds of acres, or hundreds of miles, I should say. So um, um, that's a, a really good sort of starting place to think about our movement, migration, and scale. Another one, you gotta throw at least one cute uh, fuzzy critter picture in there. Um, this is a, a long-billed curlew chick. Um, long-billed curlews spend about eight to nine months of their lives down in the Chihuahuan grasslands in northern Mexico and uh, uh, southern Texas and, and New Mexico. Um, they come up to the northern Great Plains to basically feed and forage just the way we think about birds going up to the Arctic Circle. So these birds are active almost all hours of the day. This curlew's parents um, you know, would generally make a flight up to Montana from the panhandle of Texas. It would make it to Montana in, in something like two to three days. When they fly back to the grasslands in Chihuahua, they can usually make that trip in about a day and a half. So it gives you an idea of the movements that these birds make. If this is actually a South Carolina curlew, which you can't tell unless you can get them to just talk just right and hear their accent, <laughs> there is a relic population of long-billed curlews that winter on the coast of South Carolina, and those birds also migrate and breed in north central Montana. So when we start thinking about migration for those birds, we have to think about you know just these much bigger areas and the fact that these birds sort themselves out yearly by where's the habitat and being attracted to you know, big patches. So if we get a little less exotic and we get to a more resident bird, so greater sage grouse. Um, sage grouse in, in this part of the world have both migratory and non-migratory populations at the very northern edge of their range, um, which extends into Saskatchewan. These birds will move over 100 miles a year um, and they make that migration um, twice a year, both in the spring and in the fall. Um, breeding up in northern Montana or in southern Saskatchewan and then uh, wintering closer to the Missouri River um, in Montana. So again, thinking about the scale and the movement of these, of these species, and you start to get the idea that conservation in the Great Plains, and especially in the northern Great Plains, needs to be um, at the tens of millions of acres as we start to think about how do we work with people, how do we conserve this habitat, that um, trying to do things at the scale of hundreds of thousands or even uh, single millions of acres is a pretty small potion stamp when you start to think about um, how these species move. So just one other um, uh, species slide here and, and starting to get into the, um, the, the harder, more challenging part of this is so there's three grassland birds up here. The, uh, the one on the left in the lower bottom is McCown's longspur. It's funny, he's got a picture of him on a sagebrush because they hate shrubs. Um, but um, this bird loves the grass as short as you can possibly get it. And actually bare ground is not a bad thing for McCown's longspurs. This uh, bird on the lower right is a Sprague's pipit, which has been considered as a candidate for listing um, as a threatened species. Sprague's pipit's kind of like it in the middle. Um, they like some grass, um, but they don't want to be overwhelmed with grass. And if you, if you look at this photo here, this bird actually just left the nest bowl here. This is a trap camera picture. And they, they actually use grass to fold over their nest to conceal their nest from predators, which is a you know, pretty, pretty amazing thing out there. This third uh, bird is Baird Sparrow. Baird Sparrow is basically like it tall and dense. Um, so when you look at these three species overall, they like it very different. They all co-occur in the same general geography. You don't find one in far eastern Montana and one in central Montana. They're all kind of in there finding habitat together. If you look at that table on the top, this is your 401k, you don't feel so good about things. And it's not so good either if, if you're a grassland bird. So, Grassland birds out of all the bird assemblages in North America um, are experiencing the steepest and most consistent declines of, of any bird group. Um, 
And uh, some of these species, like McCown's longspur, these birds have been monitored pretty consistently since the mid-1960s. The decline on McCown's longspur is about 92%. Um, so huge drops in numbers. Okay, and so when we think about these birds, you know, what's going on? They like different grassland types. So it's not that we're managing too much one way or the other. And really the challenge that we have, the big threat in the Northern Great Plains outside of climate change, which is the, the global threat, but this, this more localized threat is conversion. And um, it's not very well known. I think if you ask kids in Montana about the Amazon, they would know a lot about deforestation in the Amazon. We actually have a worse than Amazon situation in parts of the Northern Great Plains. So the rate of change in the Prairie Pothole region, which is includes the High Line in Montana, north of the Missouri River, is double the rate of loss in the Amazon. Now, acres-wise are considerably different based on the size of the Amazon, but just that rate of change. And remember I talked about how grasslands are really great at uh, putting carbon in the ground because three quarters of that plant is grown below ground. In a research paper from 2015, uh, Tyler Lark documented that um, based on on the average um, release of, of carbon from plowing up those grasslands. So when you till them, carbon comes out of the soil, um, is released into the atmosphere and continues to do so for about 20 years, although there's a big flux release um, to begin with. That was the equivalent of adding 28 million more cars to the road. So that is a lot of carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere. Um, the other thing is that um, a lot of this conversion now is going on on the least sustainable soils, so thin soils, soils that are highly erodible, um, so um, places that are not good for crop production. So the question is, well, that's pretty grim and depressing. Why is that so grim and depressing? And there's, there's you know, kind of three kind of major drivers in, of conversion. One is there's been a big shift in agriculture. Um, if you look at say farm machinery, for example, from 50 years ago compared to machinery today, it's, it's gigantic compared to what people would have been using historically. There's also been a lot of aggregation of farm ownerships, a lot of corporate um, engagement in, in farm ownerships. And so um, uh, there's been a real sort of move towards uh, people becoming just farmers or just ranchers versus historically, they would have been more blended operations of grazing and crop production. There are also a great safety net. If you produce crop commodities, there's a payment in there somewhere in the farm bill that will help you through either direct payments or disaster payments or crop insurance, which is basically pay you if you get, have, have a disaster. And so there's a real safety net and there's not a safety net for cattle. The only safety net for cattle is that you lose a lot of cattle because of drought or a huge storm and you're eligible now for a loan to help you go borrow more money to pay back those cattle that you lost. So it's a very uneven playing field between crop production and livestock production. And then third um, was a, an idea of good intentions but bad consequences. And that was the renewable fuel standard which passed uh, in the early 2000s. And the idea was that rather than burning um, petroleum, we would grow corn and corn ethanol would replace oil as a source of energy. Well, it turns out that there's not much and probably zero uh, gain through using corn ethanol. But the other problem is that it spurred a huge amount of conversion um, in, the, in the corn belt and in the near corn belt. So the eastern Dakotas um, saw a huge amount of plow up and a huge amount of turnover of existing small grains that then got moved further west. So that has now speared and driven a whole bunch of cropland conversion into more of the dry and, and more arid and less sustainable uh, croplands. So um, um, one of the things that we see, and I touched on this before, is that the growth of cropland is twice the rate on on these really marginal soils than it is on good soils, in part because we've mostly put all the good soils into, into farm production. And, and just to give you an idea, if you look over here uh, at this map, green is grass. Um, so you can see in the Great Plains and in the tidal marsh area of um, Texas and Louisiana, uh, 
we're at about a 50% grass. So that's, you know, that's better than a whole lot of places on the planet, which have seen worse loss than that. Like I said, in the Northern Great Plains, we're about two thirds. So you see a lot of green up there. And if you look, the brown is cropland, you know, not surprisingly, places like Iowa are mostly in crop production. What is somewhat surprising and, and scary is if you look at this orange, and this document is produced every year by the World Wildlife Fund by looking at satellite imagery to, to look at loss of, of um, grassland cover, eastern South Dakota just lights up in orange. And what's going on is those grassland pieces that were in between farm ground, those are being you know, pretty heavily converted. You'll see that there is some of that going on in uh, Montana, especially along the High Line as well. Um, our loss rates have not been as bad here this last year. Um, on average, um, before 2017, um, pretty much starting about 2010 to 2016, it was about a million acres a year in the Northern Great Plains um, being put into crop production. That includes Saskatchewan and Alberta as well as in the US. So that's all really depressing. I'm glad I didn't run out of time. So there is um, reason for hope, and that's um, what I'm gonna be talking about um, uh, next and, and basically for the rest of my presentation. So like I said, we have a, a palette of 120 million acres that we can sort of think about how do we deploy conservation on and how do we work with the people that control and manage um, that 120 million acres, which in the Northern Great Plains is about 75% private land. So this is mostly a private land um, area. And if you take a look, you know, we're fortunate that um, if this extended up in Saskatchewan and Alberta, you would see a big green area up here, but we really have this nice continuous kind of connection of grasslands from um, more or less Southeastern Alberta down to the Nebraska Sandhills. And the, the connections that you see and the disturbance that you see here includes all disturbance. So whether it's highways or um, oil fields or gas fields or some other kind of industrial development. So you see a lot of green out there and there's a lot to be hopeful with that amount of green that we can really do a lot to support a lot of species. But our scale of our work needs to be thinking about that level of green that's on the landscape. Um, the other really great thing that we're able to work with, remember when I was talking about sort of how difficult it is in the Great Basin, they sort of have this um, more challenging situation about how do you manage those Great Basin grasslands with, with um, livestock. In the Northern Great Plains and in the Great Plains overall, this is a grazing adapted system. And as we look closer and closer, the losses that we see associated with those species that I put up there is because they can't tolerate and won't tolerate cropland. And so things like pronghorn are more resilient and more tolerant of cropland. Sage grouse are pretty intolerant. They're kind of allergic to it. And those grassland birds are entirely allergic. So those grassland birds, which you know are as big as your fist, generally create a territory about an acre in size around their nest, but their settlement patterns are based on about a quarter of a million acres of grass. So if you have 640 acres of the most perfectly managed grass out there, your probability of having those three birds and the overall suite of over 20 endemic grassland birds is pretty low. So we need to be thinking about if we're gonna have all of those grassland <laughs> birds out there, our conservation needs to be thinking at the quarter of a million acre scale as sort of functional units um, to look at and think about. The other thing, and uh, Charlie Messerly is our ranch manager there on the left and uh, one of our grass bank uh, members on the right, is that there's a lot of overlap of interest between conservation and ranching. I've worked in this for a long time, sometimes it it doesn't seem like that based on words that people use, but if you go and really have conversations with people and understand and sort of do a little bit uh, of interpretation, um, ranch families, ranch ownerships are dependent on healthy grasslands. Um, they value being able to see, I'm making just broad generalizations here, but ranchers value seeing, you know, wildlife out there on their ranch as well. It's a very extensive, um, way of, uh, of life and a very um, 
you know, um, engaged um, with the land. So based on those three things, I'm going to now just talk about um, what we think are some of those strategies and solutions um, to get to in the Northern Great Plains. So the very first um, I'm going to talk about is the Matador Ranch, um, which is a, a TNC property at 60,000 acres. We own half and we lease uh, about 29,000 from the BLM in the state of Montana, um, but we're responsible for managing those public lands as well as our private lands. And on the ranch, we've operated a grass bank since about 2003. To begin with, it was a really small um, program, and today it's, it's gone to, to a, a bigger full-fledged program. And the grass bank is, is a really sort of external focus based approach. What we're doing is we have all this um, available forage on the matador. And um, what we're doing with that forage is that we're making it available to ranches that are in good ecological condition and with um, ranches that want to work um, with us in conservation. And we'll make that forage available at a lower cost depending upon the conservation actions that a landowner decides to take. And we have a menu of actions that they can choose from. So we lease the grass from them. Um, they come on the matador not based on well i've been there for the last 10 years but what are your conservation discounts every year so it's a it's not a grazing association or, or you know like public land where you have an allotment um, you're there every year based on on the values that you bring we manage the grazing and all the elements of of the ranch management itself and then the ranchers um, are managing the cattle and the um, and the um, movement of those cattle and the health of those cattle. So um, one of the things that we do that's really unique on the Matador is that um, we have 18, this year we have 18 family ranches on the, on the ranch. We have three different livestock herds and all those livestock herds have blended ownership. So what that means is that when you show up, um, your cattle are gonna be in with, you know, maybe five to 13 other um, ranches and also your neighbors are all going to be bringing bulls which are going to be important for you to you know produce calves um, and so there's a high amount of coordination and trust um, within the ranchers and um, and for our staff at the Matador. So uh, where are we at for outcomes? The ecological stuff is always the easier part to describe you know sort of in acres or numbers of critters kind of thing but um, based on the 60,000 acres that we manage and the grass bank ranches, there's about 310,000 acres on, on 14 fully operating ranches. We also have four beginning ranches because we want to help transition um, ranch ownership um, over time. Those ranchers, those 14 ranches cover about 310,000 acres. Um, those 310,000 acres are a blend of both private and public land. Um, and um, for those um, private land acres, um, all of those ranches have a grazing management plan that employs best management practices in a, in a fairly conventional range management way that, you know, cattle are being moved on the property, the stocking is appropriate based on the amount of grass that's available. Um, so these ranches are going to look a lot like the Matador if you went and visited them in the sense that they're going to be, you know, pretty well managed, um, or they are well managed. Um, one uh, feature that we require for being on the Matador is that you cannot break any native ground that's on your ranch. If you ever break native ground, you're forever out of the grass bank. So we don't want people bringing livestock to the Matador and then creating cropland at, at home. And every year we, um, as a result, protect about 80,000 acres of uh, uh, grassland that's on soils that are suitable for for um, conversion. Now the total acres of private grassland acres is higher, but not all those acres are suitable for conversion. There's about 70,000 of those acres on um, those private uh, ranch acres um, that are managed in a way that's uh, beneficial for sage grouse, both in maintaining sagebrush cover and healthy grassland cover, but marking fences where there's likely to be collisions with fences. And interestingly, sage grouse don't see fences very well under low light. If they fly low to the ground, um, they have a, a good potential of running into fences. 
by putting small markers on those fences, we can reduce that collision rate by about 95% um, and potentially higher. We also require that they put in little metal escape ramps and water tanks. So just like cows wanting to go drink, metal arcs go and drink out of um, these uh, stock water tanks and so do sage grouse. If you don't have a, a ramp in there and they fall in when they drink, which is something I'd probably do, um, you don't have a way out. So just a simple thing like putting in a ramp um, helps save uh, you know, an untold number of sage grouse every year. And then we also have discounts that relate to prairie dogs. And you know, generally prairie dogs are kind of a four letter word when you start talking with people about grazing and cattle and those sorts of things. Um, but every year we maintain somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,500 acres of prairie dogs and have really created some tolerance by working with people uh, for those prairie dog acreage um, on their ranches. And those numbers of acres are more constrained by sylvatic plague, which is an exotic disease that kills prairie dogs um, than it is by, by control actions by landowners. The other um, elements of this, which are sort of the soft and fuzzy things that you can't really uh, map so well is trust that, you know, we've been out there doing this now um, uh, for uh, 15 years, going uh, 16 years. And, um, you know, it started out at first where people were like, okay, what are these guys, you know, really about with the Nature Conservancy? And, you know, honestly, we have the same sort of kind of questions about are these ranches really committed to conservation? And over time, you spend enough time together, um, you work on management together. This is a very collaborative process. Every year, we put together a grazing plan. Every year, that grazing plan changes. This year, it changed pretty wildly. Last year was super dry. It changed quite a bit. Um, and so um, we have uh, continuous conversations on a monthly basis with our grass bank members, um, with the entire group, and, and, and more frequently individually. And we talk about management and we look at things together. We're out on those grass bank ranches doing monitoring work, um, working with them on management on their ranches. So it really has built a high level of trust. The other thing that, that you don't see, it's cut off on the bottom of the screen, is there's also a huge amount of shared learning. So whenever we have a grass bank meeting, we have a full in-person grass bank meeting uh, twice a year, there's about 500 years or more of grazing management experiences in that room between all those ranchers um, and our staff. So. There's you know, a lot of benefit in diversity of opinions, diversity of experience. And so what we're trying to do is glean all that and bring that in together and really see if we can't come to better outcomes based on that shared learning versus um, TNC standing on a soapbox. So the, um, uh, one of our other really key tools out there, it's great that the Matador helps us out. It's more of a short term conservation outcome. Um, so to permanently lock in those acres to know that grass is going to stay there, we're using conservation easements. Um, those easements are really focused on working with family ranches. Um, interestingly enough, um, when I first started working um, up in this part of the world, people mostly thought easements were a bad deal. You were going to end up basically losing your ranch. And I was going to somehow end up, you know, being out there um, uh, kind of running the show. But the reality is that as people have gotten experience with easements, um, today the demand for easements is more than I can keep up with. It's more than our financial resources are um, to, um, to allow us to complete all of our projects. And what's really been interesting to see is that ranch families now are using the, the easements. Sometimes we'll pay full fair market value for an easement. Sometimes a landowner will make a significant contribution to the value, but still get some payment for them. Um, and what's, what's really interesting is that ranches now are using those easement payments to either grow their ranch to allow the kids to come back to the operation, or they're using it as a transition payment so mom and dad can retire that's their 401k now, and now the kids can operate on the ranch. So it's really created a, a pathway for, for changes in, in ranch ownership. And, and I, I failed to mention, for those that aren't familiar with an easement, basically it's a restriction on the deed. So the easement says you can raise livestock out there, but you can't plow the grasslands, you can't um, 
implement some sort of industrial development. You can't put a wind farm on it, for example. Um, those sorts of things. So it allows the ranches to continue to manage and operate their ranch. And they're the, they're the steward that, you know, manages that property. Um, the Nature Conservancy isn't looking over their shoulder every day. And you can't see the numbers here, um, at least um, in the room, because they're covered up. But um, we've uh, completed about 68,000 acres of easements uh, since um, 2010. So um, those easements are tied to about 171,000 public lease acres. Um, so those, those private acres may or may not have a BLM allotment or state leases associated with them. But together those, you know, bind together almost, well, uh, just about at a quarter of a million acres. So those are the scales that, you know, when we're thinking about grassland birds, we're starting to get to that scale that we want to be at. Another uh, uh, technique or tool that we're using is the one that, that's a little bit hard to get out called Candid Conservation Agreement with Assurances. Um, so we'll just call it CCAA. And even that's sort of hard. I don't know why. A's together are, are sort of difficult. So there's a lot of conversation and quite a bit of anxiety and animosity over the Endangered Species Act. CCAAs are part of the Endangered Species Act. They've not been used widely, um, and um, so they're just starting to now gain traction. But basically what a CCAA is, it's a voluntary agreement between a landowner, and in this case, the Nature Conservancy essentially um, doing the work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. If a species becomes listed and a landowner has implemented management practices on their property that, that benefit these species, um, then that landowner is not subject to any other regulatory um, restrictions that, that relate to management of their property. And when I say, you know, management actions, so things like rotational grazing is absolutely, you know, an allowed sort of thing. What you don't want to have is planting tree rows in the middle of grassland, for example. Or if, say, if you have an area with a lot of conifers that have encroached into grasslands, um, we or the service or another partner will work with you to remove those conifers to make that grassland available for sage grouse. And I forgot to mention that the, there's five species right now in this CCAA. So sage grouse is one, which includes um, these green areas and the map on the right includes uh, southwestern Montana um, and uh, includes a big part of central and part of southeastern Montana. And then those four species of grassland birds that we talked so in the case of sage grouse and Sprague's pipit, um, those species will both come back up for consideration again to be uh, reevaluated as threatened species in 2020. <laughs> so as much as we can do ahead of time to demonstrate and alleviate issues for those species on private land, uh, the more likely those species don't need to go to being listed. And if good things are happening on private land, and on public land, um, those populations should be healthy and sta stable and, and hopefully um, rebounding. So we just started this program in January. Um, we had to go through a, a fairly big process with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, you can look up all this stuff on, on the internet if you're more interested. So to date, we've completed two plans with landowners. They're given what's called a certificate of inclusion which means you now have assurances. So we'll just say those on that 24,000 acres on those two ranches, they have assurances. Um, Kelsey Malloy, who's our CCA um, uh, program director, is working right now on 11 more agreements um, that cover about another 96,000 acres. And what we're hoping to do with this, um, with this tool is to get, again, to, you can see we're we're already going to surpass, if all these projects come into play this year, we'll already surpass over 100,000 acres of voluntary best management by landowners. We're hoping that this is the kind of action that could affect millions of acres. And hypothetically, across the Northern Great Plains, you know, tens of millions of acres. Um, so these are the sort of practices that start to get to scale when we think about sage grouse across eastern Montana and these grassland birds. And you know, one, one part of being in this program, like I had indicated with those conifers, is that 
Landowners are also um, available to tie into funds to help them, you know, restore cropland, that's marginal cropland, um, uh, improve grazing management, mark fences, um, all those sorts of things. So one other thing that, that we do at the Matador is that we do a lot of crazy things. So not too terribly crazy where nobody will want to talk to us, but just crazy enough that people kind of scratch their head. So um, uh, some examples of that is that, you know, most, most people's experience in the Northern Great Plains with fire is that something you do not want. Um, we know that fire is a really important driver of, um, of uh, the ecology of the Northern Great Plains historically. And so we, we had a couple of years ago, a master's student work on looking at what's called patch burn grazing. So you, you burn an area, and then within a matter of weeks after it's burned and it's greening up, you now allow um, ungulates in to graze it. And what happens is that that green grass is kind of like your favorite flavor of ice cream. All those cows or elk or any other critter that's you know, big and loves grass, that's where they go to eat. That creates short, very short vegetation. So things like those McCowns, long spurs, and other shorter grassland birds, they're attracted to that short vegetation. The remainder of the area, say within a pasture, gets almost no grazing. So it creates tall vegetation stature. So things like that Sprague's Pippet and Baird Sparrow now are attracted to that part of the, of the pasture. Um, we're also working on this, uh, what I talked about before, the idea of can we more efficiently graze grasslands? Can we make ranches more profitable by thinking about blended um, ownerships of cattle um, where um, um, I've got 50 yearlings, you've got 50 yearlings, and if we could run those together, we could better manage our grass versus trying to rotate all these animals around each other. So um, really trying to look for some efficiencies in, in grazing management that's beneficial for, for grasslands as well as for livestock producers. And then uh, another thing that we're really working on is, is trying to implement um, suppression management for crested wheatgrass. Crested wheatgrass is a tame grass that's planted for forage production and um, unfortunately it invades into native grasslands. So if you looked at our crested wheatgrass areas we have on the Matador, we try to get them to look as much like this tabletop as we possibly can to prevent their spread and, and seed production. So I've been talking about all this work that the Nature Conservancy is doing, but we're not doing that in a vacuum. We're doing that with all these um, state and federal partners and NGOs as well as with private landowners. And really what we're trying to get after is this virtuous cycle of um, people are valuing the grass that's out on that landscape who are making a living from it. They're making a, a good quality living and they have a quality life that supports their local communities. And that in turn supports conservation and retaining that grassland that's out there. So when we go to think about our projects, we're engaging with, with many of these partners. Um, they all bring different strengths to the table. And so um, it's, it's really a great uh, partnership that's out there. Well, like I said, we can't do any of this unless we're working with the people that manage and own 75% of those grasslands that are out there. And we can't be successful if we don't work on management that keeps family ranchers out there ranching. So this is one of our our young ranchers um, is actually um, working into buying into a ranch um, this year and his kids, and that's sort of the future of grasslands um, in large part the way we see it. Just a, a few other things real quickly. Um, I, I didn't uh, mention that some of our other really key partners and one that we're hoping to do more so with Montana State University in the future um, is how do we move forward on science? So. Uh, we worked with Alberta Conservation Association, that other university in Montana, and, um, and now with the National Wildlife Federation at looking at how do we make fences, which are probably the most ubiquitous structure out on these landscapes, friendly so that pronghorn can, uh, can uh, get through fences. And we, we tested a whole bunch of different things, but one of the things you'll see here is there's a little carabiner clip on, on this fence that raises the fence up in just a few select locations, these pronghorn quickly find them. And what's interesting is then they're young, um, 
quickly learned from mom where those openings are at. And all of a sudden we can open up miles of fence that may have been a barrier previously by just using a few cents worth of uh, carabiner clips. The other thing that I wanted to talk about, just, uh, uh, just a few closing things, is just an example of where I think you should also feel hopeful about the Northern Great Plains. So there's a, a group called Rancher Stewardship Alliance. It, up until coming in November, they've, they don't, have not had staff. It's all a landowner, rancher-based collaborative um, that works with conservation groups. And uh, they're based out of Malta. So, um, you know, just folks that want to keep uh, their grasslands and their community intact, put together a conservation committee, which that committee helped them develop a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant, and then a subsequent National Wildlife Foundation grant. And so with those two grants, they've installed um, uh, grazing practices on, on former conservation reserve program lands. Um, that would most likely gone back into being cropland. Um, so over 7,500 acres of CRP now will stay in grass because of infrastructure put in place. They've worked with landowners to seed back over 6,000 acres of marginal cropland back into native grass cover. Um, and they've also worked to implement this more intensive grazing management on crested wheatgrass as well as um, um, killing out and restoring crested wheatgrass to um, to native planting. So all of that is done or in progress in two years by basically a group of volunteers. Um, that's a pretty impressive um, start for a, for a very small NGO. So what does all this look like out on the ground? So I, I showed that big map before. Um, here's Malta, here's Glasgow. That's about 70 miles um, by, by highway. This bright green blob down here is the Matador, both fee land as well as our, our lease land. These uh, other light green areas are conservation easements. We just closed on another one yesterday, um, right over in here. Um, and um, so those are those acres that I was talking about. But remember, we're doing this work with lots of partners, though I forgot to mention. These uh, orange areas here are those grass bank branches. So you can see how that 300, plus thousand acres of grass bank branches um, plays out. But we also have a bunch of work by, by uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service. So these uh, dark orange areas here just north of Matador, those are all under US Fish and Wildlife Service easements, Montana Fish and Wildlife and Parks easements, um, and lots of US Fish and Wildlife Service easements up here in, in Northern Phillips County. So when you start looking at those acres together, there's over 128,000 acres of conservation easements um, between um, the, those three entities. Oops. So where are we headed? Well, there's going to be growth of all those things that I talked with you about. We're hoping to um, actually launch another grass bank um, in central Montana. We've been working with uh, some communities who have um, been interested and in, have asked us to come in and see if there's a way we can do that. Um, we're looking at doing that as a partnership with the Rancher Stewardship Alliance and um, with local communities. So we're hoping um, next time that I can come back and maybe give this presentation in the future, there'll be more zeros and bigger numbers. Um, but also the fact that, you know, that rate of conversion has really been dampened and that um, there's that much more trust and, and shared learning um, with those private landowners who um, manage that property, manage those properties and, and do so well out there for the land. So with that, I'll take um, questions that you might have. Yeah. I look at the people that were hired to do conservation missions, but also you talk about how Yeah, so we're, we're working actually right now with World Wildlife Fund to try to figure out what's the carbon budget of, say, grazing in the Northern Great Plains um, with greenhouse gases, because it is an issue. Um, um, interestingly, if it, it, let's say if all the cattle were gone and it was bison, it would be the same issue. It's still ungulates releasing 
methane, um, which you do when you digest grass. Um, but recall that there is also a lot of carbon sequestration going on by those grasses, um, um, you know, putting um, uh, carbon in the ground. Kind of the wild card in this whole thing is thinking about, well, there's a lot of cattle that go to corn. And so thinking about that whole corn part of the cycle is, is, a, is a big part of what we need to understand. But it's a really important question in thinking about sort of this balance between keeping grasslands healthy and intact versus carbon emissions. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for your talk. It was really awesome. Very Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. I'm I'm curious about the squishy parts you mentioned with the sort of crust building, um, and what your reflections are uh, as to sort of the secret sauce that the Matador has. You know, what do you think made the difference in building an environment where you feel like social learning is possible? Well, I you know I I think there's probably a couple things. One is that it was it was really important to have a property to be able to go out and manage and work with people on because all of a sudden when you were talking about something and using different language than maybe the ranchers were saying but you actually were saying the same thing you could see that out on the land you know the outcomes were what really were important versus how we necessarily talked about them and then i think it really boils down to working with people that want to work with you as funny as that sounds you know um, the grass bank has really become a, a really important part of the community in the sense that it brings people together who may know each other but have never worked together. So they're, you know, the county's huge. It, uh, you know, would be a Delaware sort of size county or something. Um, so when you think about that and people living 60, 80 miles apart, being able to bring people together and really kind of creating an opportunity for them to also learn and share from each other. And, and I think one of the things that has really been um, stated by a bunch of our grass bank folks is that they really think it's and really value the fact that we will listen to what they have to say and that we'll make management changes um, based on their input. It's not just a top down, this is how it goes. We know better than you because, you know, Brian's got some degrees in range science or something. Um, so I, I think that's really the key. Talk a little bit more about the CCAAs and the time scale of their Sure. So a CCAA um, is voluntary. So um, you could have one on an easement, a property with an easement, but it doesn't have to be. It can just, you know, um, it's a 20 year agreement. Um, and then, you know, hypothetically, um, you know, that those agreements, um, if they terminate, could be renewed with, a, you know, you have to go through all the paperwork again through the, the federal register and all that sort of stuff. But basically, it's that voluntary agreement and really think about it as there's a bunch of people doing good out there. Um, there's always things that any ranch owner, including the Nature Conservancy, could do a little bit better. Um, but people are doing good. Let's reward that and recognize that. And that's really what the CCA does is that it says here's a ranch that's doing the right things out there. They shouldn't be subject to additional regulation if an ESA listing happens. And so it really provides in a way from a, a risk management issue for any business is knowing can you operate next year pretty much on the same parameters that you operated this year. And it really allows people to get to that level that, you know, those assurances mean that the, the, game, the rules of the game, so to speak, are not going to change. Yeah. How do you relate to the American Prairie Reserve? Well, so a APR is really in a mode of buying land and having landowners go. Um, we're working on the exactly opposite track. Um, we're working with landowners who are there and supporting because, again, this stewardship, these stewardship actions that people are doing are conducive to retaining um, the species that we're interested in working out there. We're also thinking about and working at scales that are, you know, uh, an order of magnitude or bigger than what they're really thinking about. So it won't do us any good to get 3 million acres of grassland conservation accomplished, you know, at the cost of a billion dollars if we can't um, conserve um, the, the range of habitats 
that those species need. So we have a very different sort of scale approach and a very different human um, interaction approach. The person, do we have anybody online? Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. All right, thank you.